Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. A new day for the coal fields. I'm Jim Probst. I'm the state coordinator uh, from West Virginia. I'm excited about uh, our panel today. I'm not going to talk very much. We have uh, Adele Morris. Um, Adele, it has been said that Adele is the go-to person when Congress has questions about the economics of carbon pricing. Adele offered, auth authored in 2016 a paper on building a better future for coal workers in their communities, which I have used a lot. She's a se senior fellow and policy director for climate and energy economics at the Brookings Institute, and she's also a member of CCL's Board of Advisors. Our other speaker today is Paul Burke. He's the co-chair of our chapter in uh, West Virginia CCL chapter in the Eastern Panhandle. He has consulted for Congress's Office of Technology Assessment and the UN Development Program. So, I <clears throat> so me, I have no professional qualifications whatsoever. These are my uh, qualifications for being here today. These are my grandkids. So I, I have a very short introductory uh, presentation, just takes a couple minutes here. A um, friend of mine wrote this for me, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, photographs provided by Earl Daughter. <clears throat> Since the first coal miners in the U.S. went underground to retrieve rich deposits of coal, they have died in roof falls, explosions, and other accidents, and they have suffocated slowly from lung disease. What do we owe them? Coal powered the railroads, the steel industry, and the electric grid. In short, the Industrial Revolution. But this black gold, requ gold required miners and their labor to bring it above ground for human use. What do we owe them? Despite fierce and violent opposition from mine owners, coal miners led the interracial industrial union movement fighting and dying for the right to organize and inspiring resistance among workers across the U.S. What do we owe them? Not only coal miners, but their communities now bear the scars and wounds of coal's destructive extraction, especially from surface mining with leveled mountains, contaminated streams, and water supplies, denuded hillsides, and excessive flooding. What do we owe them? Today, as we transition to renewable, cleaner forms of energy, communities once depended upon coal mining are left with crumbling public infrastructure unemployment, poverty, and high rates of disability and disease, including the highest rate of opioid overdose in the country. What do we owe them? If there is to be a just transition from the fossil fuel economy of the past to a new economy powered by renewable energy, it should begin with the coal mining people of Appalachia. We owe it to them. And I can't see, but I know Earl is here. Earl, would you care to stand up? Earl Daughter uh, 
kindly provided all those photographs for me, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Earl. Well, thank you so much for that, Jim. And I, I really think that speaks to the heart of the issue. Um, and, you know, as those powerful images resonate um, for you, I'm going to give you the arguments to the head um, and show you some data and really explain why we are even talking about this. Um, obviously, we want to achieve our climatic goals in a fair way, and that's been a central value for CCL since its inception. What we're talking about today is another dimension of fairness. Like, what, what do we do in the instance where there's a disproportionately burdened set of people in our country um, that we know for a fact are going to be burdened because that's the way you achieve your climate goals? So that's what I'm going to talk about right now. And how do you, do you, which, okay, the green one, okay. So I'm gonna start with the old bad news. I'm gonna talk about the bad news ahead. Um, and when I say bad news, I'm talking about bad news for the coal production in the United States. The flip side obviously is this is good news because we're lowering our greenhouse gas emissions. But for the people who've been relying on coal, this is a big deal and it's gonna, it's going to get bigger. And I want to end with what I th hope is a hopeful note about what we can do to um, mitigate this bad news and actually build a brighter future for people in coal country. So we know that coal is twice as carbon intensive per unit of energy as natural gas. And I focus on natural gas because it's its um, closest substitute in its major market, which is the power sector. Um, so if all you did, nothing else, was switch from coal to natural gas, that, that's a 50% reduction in emissions uh, associated with that, with that energy content. We're already seeing a decline in coal use in the United States. And I'll show you in a second why that is, but a lot of it's driven by natural gas prices. And because they're such close substitutes, we're seeing a big move from coal to natural gas. And so um, coal consumption has just been shrinking. And, and, and that means there's already hard times in coal country. This is the slide that shows you where our electricity is coming from. And that blue line that's kind of sort of very systematically been reducing since 2007 is coal, um, coal fired uh, generation. And natural gas is kind of uh, rising from behind, but we also see non-hydro renewables, that's your wind and solar, also taking up some of that uh, generation share. And that's, uh, the natural gas uh, dynamic has largely been driven by the fracking revolution that has greatly reduced natural gas prices in the United States. So what we're seeing so far is largely a result of you know, supply and demand for fuels in the power sector. This is not, you know, miraculous policy behind that. In some cases, there were state level um, clean energy policies, and to some extent, there was uh, some influence by air, air quality regulations. But a lot of what's been happening to drive coal out of the power sector has just been the economics of the fuels. And you can see what that means is it means that production of these uh, of coal has dropped. And it's dropped both in the east in Appalachia and it's dropped in the west. And so the total decline in U.S. coal production you can see in that, that dotted red line. And this data is a little old and it's gone down even further. So what that means is a combination of mines closing and lower production at remaining mines. So Half the mines that were in operation in 2008 have closed, and there's plans for more closures of coal-fired power plants, and that's going to result again in a decline in the mine count and production. So this is all stuff that's happened so far. And you can see again in different places that declines have been different, but there's really been no place that's spared a reduction in coal production. 
And along with that production is a reduction in jobs. And so this comes from two things. It comes from the decline in production, but it also comes from the fact that coal production is moving to areas where it's highly mechanized. Out in Wyoming, they can produce way more coal per worker than they can in the mines of Appalachia. So all of those trends together mean that now we have about a third of the workers in the coal mining industry in the United States than we did in the mid-1980s. Coal is also suffering a bunch of other factors, and we know that the declining costs of renewables, which is a good thing, is another headwind to the coal industry. And um, electricity demand really hasn't grown very much. Our energy efficiency uh, measures have actually done a lot to suppress what would otherwise be rising electricity demand. And so increasingly, U.S. coal is looking to export markets, but those are quite fickle as well because it depends on transport costs and the value of the dollar and all kinds of th in production in other countries. So the point of this slide is to say there's not an obvious way out for the U.S. coal industry. This is going to be an industry that will face continued decline. And that decline is going to depend, though, on what kind of policy future we have. So if we don't manage to pass climate uh, uh, policy or carbon pricing legislation, we're still going to have challenges in the coal industry. But if we undertake something really ambitious and really effective environmentally, that's going to mean really the, the rapid demise of coal. So this is a, some projections from uh, the Energy Information Administration if we don't have new climate policy. So watch that brown line go down. So the, the amount of electricity in the left-hand graph that's fired with coal is going to be declining, and the amount of uh, the share of generation that's coal is going to be declining. So that's if we don't have any new policies. Now I want to talk to you about what we, what we expect if we do have new policies. So this is some modeling results, again, by EAA, looking at a carbon fee within the power sector. So this is a power sector only. So they're starting at $25 per ton. That's the green dash line. And this is how CO2 would decline from the power sector through the mid-2030s if, um, if we had that uh, carbon price. Now, the, the blue line is what without the policy, and the green line is with the policy. So you can see that that would really dramatically reduce emissions. But it even more disproportionately reduces coal use. Much, much of that decline in CO2 comes from switching out of coal. So that same scenario that reduces emissions by 23% reduces coal consumption by 85%. And that can be concentrated in specific areas. So this is the projected um, levels of coal production in Appalachia under that same policy scenario. So you're seeing a much more dramatic drop than, than without the climate policy, but this is for the Powder River Basin. So if any of you are from Wyoming or Montana, this is, now I want to caution, this is one model, one scenario, there's lots of humility that has to be brought to these projections, but if you're sitting in the middle of the Powder River Basin, and we have a price on carbon, this is not, I mean, this is a plausible outcome for the industry in your area, and that means a lot of things, not just lost jobs, but lost severance tax revenue, all kinds of uh, implications for your area. So I did some modeling. I co-chaired a big project where we had 11 models, and we, brought, we did various carbon price scenarios. Forgive me for the T word, you know, it's my old days at the Treasury, I can't help myself. Uh, but in any case, so we were looking at different carbon price trajectories, and the CCL one is probably closest to that green, green trajectory at the top, starting about $50 and going up 5%. That was the most stringent scenario we modeled. And we tried different ways of using the revenue with rebates or tax swaps of various kinds. But the important thing is that in all of those scenarios, in all of the models, coal um, experiences a precipitous decline. This is one of the most robust results across all of the modeling outcomes, all the modeling platforms, 
that blue wedge so the top row is what we expect without policy and those other rows are the different carbon price trajectories. And if you look down there at the bottom two rows that are probably closest to the CCL um, proposals, you just see coal get creamed, um, very short order. And that's the result of the change in relative prices of the different fuels. And so that's why I'm doing so much work trying to, because we're kind of looking at the MRI of a patient with a bad prognosis. And by that, I mean the community well-being in these areas. Um, what are we going to do? Um, I just want to give you a couple other highlights from that study. Those who are, might be worried that a carbon price doesn't reduce emissions can rest assured that we have 11 models um, with an extremely strong response um, on emissions. So don't worry about that. Go to your, go to your lobby meetings uh, in full confidence. And also one thing to point out when we're backing out of coal and we're backing out of fossil fuels is the air quality improvements. So these are charts of the reduction or the levels of CO2 emissions that we expect. Um, so you see dramatic declines in air pollution. And we have more of these results for anybody with, with the peculiar taste of liking modeling results. Okay, so, so there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no way you can put a glass case around the coal industry in the United States. Some people say, well, we're gonna have carbon capture. Well, you know what, in the models, that doesn't come in until after coal is already gone. It might come in with natural gas, but it's not gonna, we're not projecting it to come in with coal. And there are all sorts of other problems that are hitting in coal country. We've got, as the number of workers declines, the pension and healthcare system for them sort of implodes. The Black Lung Liability Trust Fund is on fumes. And when coal companies go bankrupt, they have creative ways of doing that such that they discharge their liabilities for reclaiming these contaminated holes in the ground. And so that's gonna be something that I think is gonna fall to taxpayers and something we should think ahead about, maybe doing that proactively to help the people in these areas. And I'm really concerned about what happens in these areas when the, the large number of revenues that come from coal dry up. What about the severance taxes and the royalties and the property taxes, all of which have been funding schools and, and um, public services in coal reliant areas. What's gonna happen to those folks? Um, and finally, I think re regardless of all the policy back, you know, uh, modeling I've just shown you, it could be even more dramatic because we're still seeing the technologies of clean energy become more economic. So we may have underestimated how quickly coal will leave the US economy especially in the power sector. So there have been a few kind of what I would call relatively modest proposals to help out coal country. Um, what I would say is we don't have a great precedent in the United States for helping when there's a spatially concentrated collapse of an industry. We actually have a pretty terrible track record, I think, in the United States of helping in these situations. So we're gonna have to get I'm serious about thinking about what to do for these folks, but the good news is that if we have a price on carbon that raises revenue, we will be raising substantial resources, a tiny fraction of which could be channeled to the betterment of the good people that Jim was just talking about. Those communities, those workers, and I think there are a lot of positive things that can come from having those resources. Because remember, if we do Clean Air Act regulations, the same thing will happen with coal, but there will be no revenues to do anything to mitigate these disproportionate outcomes in coal country. So as you guys know, you've been studying up on the various options. Even the most modest carbon tax that I, we modeled raises over a trillion dollars in the first 10 years a trillion dollars, so maybe if we could just um, target you know, a few percentage points over 10 years of that revenue and, and do very responsible, accountable assistance in coal field areas, I think that would be a, a, a very reasonable 
modification to um, the way we've been talking about fee and dividends so far. So I just want to say that this is a transition that's going to happen, and we can do it in a way that is mindful of the burdens, um, and I think that's both morally and politically wise, and now we've just got to, you know, kind of prepare the right ingredients, and that's going to be one of my next papers, is exactly what to do. I, I'm thinking we'll save questions till at the end, if, 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 if you don't mind. Um, we've got one more speaker, and uh, I'd like to make sure that we get through all the three presentations. Uh, thank you so much, Adele. That was great, very informative and helpful. And so what we, Paul, what we have next is Paul, who's going to present um, what we see as within what Adele was talking about, taking a tiny fraction of the dividend or, or the fee collected and uh, using it for trans transition in the coal field. So, Paul. Okay, thank you. Can we get over to the next set of slides, please? So, that was a great uh, setup, Adele. Thank you very much for that, that, that story. Sad from the point of view of coal country, good from the point of view of global warming. And as you say, there's money available in a bill like CCLs. So this is a proposal, a specific proposal that, there, there we go, there we go, okay, thank you. I was seeing it here before you saw it on the big screens. Um, the volunteers in West Virginia and Indiana, actually we started discussing this at last year's June conference and added ideas of, of what would be needed. So I'll give you a brief overview, talk about the issues when mines close, which I don't need to say much because Adele just covered it so well. Our proposal, its cost, and we're going to be asking this from our members of Congress. We have handouts if some of you are interested to discuss with your lobby teams whether you will ask for your members of Congress to propose. There is no bill introduced yet, and so we're looking for somebody to introduce this or some version as an amendment, either to H.R. 763 or to any number of other bills to get something out there that then they can have hearings and they can have discussions and improve it as other people chime in. Okay, so this proposal, 44% uh, of the money would go to health benefits. As people lose their coal mining jobs, we figure they were, are likely to get jobs very often without health benefits. So the proposal would pay for that. It would pay for early retirement for people who are near retirement, pay supplements, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, uh, support between jobs, commuting expenses. We heard from social workers who s talk about people who have found jobs, but they're an hour or an hour and a half away and they don't want to move but that's a very big expense that a transition program could help with. Business startup, so that there would be more jobs forming in coal areas, and the traditional job search, training, moving costs. Um, so 50,000 jobs we have now, we expect to lose. There will remain another few thousand in coal for steel making. Maybe some for exports, depending on what other countries do. Maybe carbon capture, if that moves ahead and people are trying to do research on that. 2018 had the lowest use of coal in 40 years, the second highest coal plant closings, and as Adele said, 2019 is likely to continue that. The main issue is that mines are isolated without other jobs or tax revenue. So it's not easy to transition into another job. And the coal jobs pay substantially. This is, these are figures from the National Mining Association, 53,000 to 79,000, which is higher than most jobs with a college degree. And then, as Adele said, the coal taxes pay for the schools and public services. So in H.R. 763, the dividends do repay families for higher energy costs, including coal families, but not, it's not enough money to pay for lost jobs. So this New Day proposal helps coal miners who lose their jobs. It's a small group. It's the group who are most hurt 
most directly hurt by the energy transition. And this, it, it's like the agriculture set aside in that it's a very small amount. It's less than 1% of the fees. And we don't usually think of it in these terms, but H.R. 763 already has carve-outs now for agriculture, for military, for exporters, that's the border adjustment, so that those companies get their fees back. For natural gas, because methane leaks under the current thinking will not pay a fee. And that's, in the next 20 years of warming, that's about a third of the warming effect for, comes from the, for natural gas comes from the methane leaks. And then refrigerants will be charged at only 10% of the usual fee. So those are, uh, we are looking for a carve out from the dividend, from the, from the revenue, but it's not unprecedented and it's a, it's a small amount. Um, so I think I went through this the, the, when I talked about the graph. So talking more specifically, we're estimating $15,000 a year for health benefits. For early retirement, we're, we're proposing half pay for people who are close to retirement age. Many of them have major disabilities, so they're not attractive to another employer, and they don't have enough years left necessarily to get the training and switch over and develop a new career. So it may be the, the best choice for them would be early retirement. We wouldn't push anybody into early retirement. They would have the alternative that younger people would have of a pay supplement. So this would pay three quarters of the gap between new and old pay rates. For example, if they've been making $60,000 at their old pay rate and they find a job at $32,000 a year, that's a $28,000 gap and the proposal is that the government would pay three quarters of that gap, so 21,000, which brings them back up to 53,000. It's not where they were, but it's a lot closer than the crash down to 32,000. And this would phase out over 10 years, so it wouldn't be forever. The next uh, category is support while they're searching for a job. Again, we're thinking of three quarters of their old pay for up to a year and then phasing down. Normal, normal uh, job transition help includes offers of training, help with searching, information about the, the market and, and job opportunities, moving expenses if needed. In the studies of the 80s dislocation, in the 1980s we had major dislocation, the workers who moved did the best. Not many wanted to move, and again, now, not many will want to move, but it's an option that helps families that are, that are willing and interested in doing that. And then the idea for new businesses, if we can offer advice, business training, virtual incubator, money at the same rate as the pay supplement, then we don't expect a lot of ex-miners would start businesses. It's hard to do, we, we know that. Um, but any who do succeed in forming a new business, say a tourism business, or a truck repair business, or solar manufacturer. I mean, we were, in this whole program, we're not trying to be prescriptive. But if we can offer options, then those businesses hire other ex-miners because they're in the community. And that, that helps deal with the transition for the community and for the other ex-miners who haven't started their own businesses. And Wyoming started, has an example that they passed a couple of years ago to foster new businesses because they, the state realizes what they're heading towards. And then the, the last fraction, which is just over half the money, is to help communities. It would replace the severance property and business taxes on coal mines. So a coal mine closes and the, com the taxes that have gone to the state, the county, the town, if it's in a town boundary, those suddenly go way down to nothing for, some, for severance and business taxes. Th there may still be some property value, but far less than it was. And so our proposal is that the program would replace that money in the first year and then phase it down over 20 years so that there would be time 
to attract other businesses and or downsize the community. I mean, there too, we're not prescriptive. It's some communities will be able to attract other businesses and continue. Other times, some communities will phase down. And we don't have, that's, we don't have a solution to that really, except to allow time for planning and for, for people to make arrangements. Um, this, the, the 13 million is the estimate for, ten, for the first 10 years. The program would last 20 years. We, apparently Congress thinks in terms of budgets for five years or 10 years. So that's why we've done our budgeting just for the first 10 years. And it's based on an old tax study of West Virginia and Wyoming that needs updating and it needs spreading to other states. But just for, for talking purposes, it gives us an idea of what the cost would be. So there's a table in the paper. The, um, the paper is on the website newday4.com. I'll show that on a later screen. And there's a table that breaks out how much money goes into each of these subprograms, considering the phase out and the number of workers who would participate. Um, that total of 25 billion is less than 1% of the 2.9 trillion that's raised by HR 763 over the first 10 years. So that's a 10 year budget compared to a 10 year budget. And it's a small, it, 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 it's real money, but as Adele said, there's so much money raised by a carbon fee that it's a small part of that pot of money. We're f there are workforce boards. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with labor force uh, programs. There are workforce boards throughout the country that are federally funded and they're run through states or counties. West Virginia has about 14. I think in California, they're mostly for each county because they have bigger counties there. And so they already exist and they have local knowledge and they run other job programs, say when a bank closes, they give help to training, not, not the extent of help because the, the impact isn't as great, but they are set up with this, so we don't need a new administration system. And we're asking Congress to attach this either to HR 763 or Van Hollen and Bayer have a cap and trade bill that's been introduced that also has a lot of money involved. We've talked uh, this last couple of days about the Reclaim Act. That takes money from the Abandoned Mine Lands Fund. This would not be eligible to, to be spent out of the Abandoned Mine Lands Fund. So if it were attached to Reclaim, it would also have to have another funding source. Uh, Representative McKinley from West Virginia and Welch from Vermont in past Congresses have regularly introduced what they call the HELP Act, which is less level, but it's the same idea of helping coal miners specifically transition. And they're proposing $500 million a year, so half a billion. And that wouldn't help as many, but it would be a good chunk of uh, a, a good start. And they don't say where that money would come from. And Senator Manchin has an American Miners Act, which is designed to help the pension system. And that would be another vehicle. But Congress is full of bills, and that's what legislators do, is they figure out how to attach um, new ideas to, to existing bills. Now, are there any people here from the great state of Arizona? California? Um, Connecticut? Well, you see, these are representatives and a few senators who in the past Congress signed on to bills that have a worker, a coal, fossil fuel worker transition program. They had very few details in any of the bills, but if you are lobbying any of these people, then they're already, they've already signed on to first, by all means, thank them for having signed on in the last Congress to this need and this issue. And they might welcome or consider, that particularly open to considering the, the proposal that we're making here, which has more detail. And here, Indiana is a coal state, Pennsylvania is a coal state, Tennessee, but you see that most of these, Arizona is a coal state, but most of these are not coal states. 
So you see there's a lot of interest from representatives all over the country in giving coal miners a fair transition. So I think that is very optimistic. Um, so this at the bottom is the website and I think now open to Jim will run questions and uh, responses. Thanks, Paul. So I, I'm not sure how much time we have, but um, we've got, yeah, we've got time for a lot of questions. So <laughs> right here. No, no, they're handling it. I'll, I apologize for my voice, but tomorrow I am um, in a lobby meeting for one of the Wyoming senators. What is the um, stance on CCL uh, in terms of this proposal? Is it an official CCL thing? I don't want to go in and suggest that something that is not approved by CCL that, that to lobby for it. Can you help me here? No, this is not an officially um, uh, official CCL uh, proposal. Uh, what Danny Richter said last night is basically if one of us goes and gets a congressman that is willing to uh, attach this to the legislation and make it uh, important and, and, and insist upon it, well, then that <laughs> we, CCL would support it. But... Um, I mean, CCL is, is, has been a officially um, helpful with the, uh, what we're doing, but at this point, no, it's not a, an official CCL uh, proposal. But also, once again, you know, I, Danny mentioned last night my work on the Reclaim Act, and I've been working on Reclaim for about three years now, and it was never an officially sanctioned CCL uh, proposal either. And but. Uh, CCL has always been supportive of, of the work I've been doing on Reclaim. So really, it's just, uh, you know, if you want are interested in talking about this with your members of Congress and think that they would be interested in supporting it, that's where the, the uh, energy is at this point. Hello, I got a question. Um, I'm, I'm going to call my uh, congressmen and senators tomorrow or sometime this week and tell them to support the uh, Dividend Act. So I also want them to add this. So what are you proposing we actually ask them? Are you proposing that we ask them to save 1% for the miners, save 3% for the miners? What's the concrete statement to make to them, to ask them? So the specific request over the phone would be to say that there is a proposal for a minor transition at newday4.com and you would like them to add that to, what, to 763 or whatever vehicle they feel is appropriate. If you're in person, we have a pile of these here on the end of the stage asking is not to tell them to go look at a website. I'm, I'm asking them what percentage are you asking yes. for? 1% of it, the revenue? It, 1%. That's the easiest way to think of it. It's slightly less, but uh, that's that's a matter of, uh, of detailed budgeting. Okay. Yeah, Thank 1%. You. It, it was probably me who muddied the waters because I was modeling a less um, ambitious carbon price, so the revenue was a little lower. So in my numbers earlier, you need like more like 3% to get the same revenue that Paul's been talking about. So, so obviously if you've got a more ambitious carbon price and higher revenue, you can get away with a lower percentage. So um, yeah, and it also depends on how Folsom you think the, the programs in coal country sh should be. So for example, I've been thinking about the issue of mine reclamation that I didn't see that in, in Paul's presentation, but it could be a really important part of solidifying the environmental improvements in coal country. And so, you know, I think probably what you're hearing is this has not all been locked down 
in, you know, well, obviously you got to do A, B, C, D. But there's going to be a diversity of views of exactly what should be done and what's within the reasonable scope of, of this carve out. Is that fair and to say? you're asking them to do on the order of 1%. I'm sure you'd be happy if they put 2% or if they put three quarters of a percent. And they'll understand that. Um, in Southeast Pennsylvania, um, we've been uh, experiencing pushback on one of our congressmen in supporting HR 763 because of the issue with AFL-CIO um, pushing back on him because of long-term loss of union jobs. Um, what's happening with the coal miners clearly is just deeply profound, but it's also a paradigm for what's going to be happening with fossil fuel workers over the years once this bill passes. Um, we've been in conversation with union leaders, beginning conversation with union leaders about what they would be looking for in terms of fair transition so that we don't make the, the men and women who've been doing this kind of work victims. Um, and and it's, it's easy for that to happen. Um, I'm not sure if I have a question, but just a reflection that, that this is just, I, I don't even want to use the word just because it, it belittles it, but um, it's the beginning of a much bigger picture Thank you for that, and we'd like to connect up with you afterwards and trade ideas and trade notes and do the, do the work together. Hi, do you see this applying to oil and gas workers? And if so, is, are there people doing the same kind of studies, the, the feasibility kind of studies that you're doing? So. That's a good question because over time, obviously, as we decarbonize the economy, it, this is going to affect oil and gas workers as well. The reason I'm a little less worried about oil and gas workers is where the way in which people are employed in oil and gas, they go, they drill a well, the well's installed, and they move on. So this is not, it doesn't quite have that same stationary impact where it's not just the workers, it's a community, it's a whole fiscal system. So yes, there will be uh, fewer and fewer jobs in oil and gas production, but the, but the community impact is, is not going to be the same. There will be, I will say, there will be fiscal issues in the state of Alaska and elsewhere because they've really relied on, on fossil fuel production as a key part of their revenue system. So they're gonna have to restructure, you know, their, their, their tax system, no question about it. But I worry a little bit less about the individuals and the families and so on that are involved. Now, there will again be impacts in um, ancillary industries. For example, a big chunk of what railroads haul is coal. So there'll be railroad impacts. There's gonna be refining impacts, you know, there'll be impacts all over the country, but the reason I'm especially concerned about coal is, like I said, the spatial concentration in these areas with very little other economic base to them, and the rapidity with which those impacts will be felt. Like oil and gas, those are a little less elastic to the carbon price, so that, that production is going to drop off more slowly. Coal, we see that as being actually very rapid. So we need to be thinking now before we even pass this legislation how we're going to manage that disruption. That's my view. That's a good point. Uh, 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 just to, uh, 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 I, I thought I was next. Am I not? Sorry, I Go ahead. Uh, I just, uh, uh, it sounds like the coal emergency for uh, lost jobs is going to peak way sooner than the uh, major uh, fund from the fee. Does your plan have a way of balancing that out, or does it simply mean that 
uh, households in general are going to be getting less uh, per month than they otherwise would at the beginning, significantly less, because of the need to go immediately to the to the need for the for the workers. So the percentages would. How, how do you handle that? We have a spreadsheet that estimates the cost and the fee revenue each year for those 10 years, and they rise together. Because what we're estimating is that of the 50,000 workers, they will lose their jobs over those 10 years. That's implied by the Remy curves, as uh, uh, we don't know. If a lot of them lose their jobs right up front, then that could be more than 1% in the first year or two. But if it's spread over 10 years, then 5,000 miners losing their jobs, they get their initial payments in that first year out of the first year fee. But then they, as their payments continue for the next 10 years, there's more and more fee coming in. So I'm probably being long-winded about that, but the payments phase in over 10 years just as the fee income phases over 10 years. So it, there is a little bit of, of shifting, but it's about 1% or so each year. So about the same year that There is not. We had that question from the Workforce Board in uh, Charleston, West Virginia. What about the people who lost their jobs the year before this program went into effect? I would like to see some phased adjustment because they are still struggling. They're not finding jobs. And we don't have a proposal for that. It may be sort of too deep a dive at this stage, but a member of Congress who introduces something would want to look at that and get some ideas for how to, how to help them to some degree. Okay, so I'm going to take my CCL hat off and put a socialistic hat on just for a, a, a minute. Um, I also am from eastern Pennsylvania and worked at a public utility uh, for 17 years as a secretary in the fossil engineering department. Went through uh, acid rain legislation, clean coal, and in the back of my mind, I, I'm always thinking, well, what about climate change? What about climate change? You know, obviously, the, I mean, somebody at the, ex at the executive level at a, at a utility should have seen it, should have prepared for it. So is there any effort for these utilities to compensate their coal miners or their coal producers? Uh, yeah? Is that Well, that what silly? I would, okay, so this is my impression of the kind of the landscape of entities that are involved in this. You have the coal companies that are the ones in there producing at these mines. These are not companies with a great reputation of treating their workers with the best of uh, intents. So, um, you know, if you're looking for something that helps the workers of that industry, I do not think going through the companies makes any sense at all. Um, for the workers at coal-fired power plants, that's, they are employed by the utility, and they're going to be losing their positions as well. Now, the thing about that, though, is in some areas that's going to be really important because, like, the, the coal-fired power plant was, like, a major employer in a big surrounding area. Um, in other cases, the power plant closes, but they're in a a metropolitan area and the workers have skills and they work in some other kind of industry and the transition is not so stark, right? So I think it's a good question. So should the federal policy take into account these downstream effects of coal going away in the power sector and so on? I don't, I don't have a strong opinion other than I would like to, see if we do that, like go down to the the coal-fired power plant level and, and so on, we need to give a little thought about how we could target those resources where the dislocation is, is the, the sharpest and most burdensome. If it's just a matter of, like, we had a little power plant in the city of Alexandria. I mean, 
we're in a giant metropolitan area. If the power plant in Alexandria closes, that, that's just not a number of jobs that you would have a special program for, you know? So I'm not giving you a very clear answer other than it, it's going to vary, I think, a lot more in the power sector than it will in the mining sector. Uh, I, I have a question, and it's because I'm not that familiar with the process of coal mining. I come, well, I don't come from Arizona, but I live in Arizona now, and I've seen some of the copper mines and the way it's been like strip mined. And, you know, they say they restore the land afterward, but uh, if that's resurrection, well, we're all going to be there. Um, it doesn't look like resurrection when I look off and see the view of the mind. Uh, is there any, I mean, I don't know the consequence of coal mining. Does it do the same kind of devastation to the land? And if so, do you guys need to be planting forests because I just came from uh, a session where it's talking about how uh, forests will consume 30% of our um, carbon emissions in yep. the future, hopefully. Uh, yes. Um, as far as devastation, yeah, uh, strip mining in West Virginia, I mean, you know, West Virginia is sometimes referred to as almost level West Virginia. Um, and... Um, I, I, I don't know, just it personally, um, uh, I, I don't live in a coal mining region in West Virginia, but the next county over is the largest uh, coal producing county in the state, and I've started spending some time down there and, and, and going into the coal mining regions a bit more, and it's, I, it's, it's awful. It's awful what they're doing. Um, like some of the sl uh, slides uh, in my presentation, uh, I didn't. I couldn't imagine that people really live in places where you walk out your back door and the mountain right behind you has been destroyed. And and uh, uh, I we have a member of uh, our group um, that's a former miner, and uh, he, from his house he's got a strip mine in one direction a mile, and another direction he's got a strip mine two miles away. Um, you know, the health effects of, of how this is affecting people in the coal fields. You know, there was a study being conducted to identify um, what people are uh, incurring as far as uh, health issues from living near strip mines. Unfortunately, uh, our current administration has put a halt to that study, but what they were finding is, you know, increased uh, occurrences of cancer, um, uh, childhood diseases, asthma, and these types of things, and um, and it's uh, you know water quality issues, air quality issues from from living near these mines, and uh, these folks that live down there and live and work in these areas are suffering uh, the effects of being in those areas, and um, uh, that's my best answer. And although there are laws that require coal companies to reclaim the land after they leave those areas. Um, a number of instances where the state government has allowed the coal companies to self-bond those liabilities using the capital asset of the company itself. So when these companies go out of business or they, they merge and they, and they split apart, they manage to discharge those liabilities in bankruptcy, and then then the good people of those areas are left with contaminated sites with no clear way for those to be mitigated. So I think, you know, we could squabble and have court cases for the next 30 years where the local people can't drink their own water, or we can in intervene with some federal dollars and get that done and engage in the water you know, with water quality authorities in the correct areas and do it right and allow people to um, have, have clean air and clean water, which they've long since deserved. Hi, 
Um, just was wondering if there's any, this might be for Adele, whether there's been any work looking at, instead of doing the carbon via dividend, taking a piece of that, putting a tax on renewables uh, for two reasons. One, it keeps carbon fee and dividend clean. And secondly, the renewable number will keep going up dramatically and the carbon fee and dividend or the carbon fee will go down over time. Well, the key- Also it should be a much smaller, I would think it would be a smaller percentage because the renewable number would be so big. Well, I think the key idea number. of the price on carbon is to include in the energy cost the damage to the environment. And you want to change those relative prices. I think we, we would have to have a more detailed conversation. I think I got a different way of looking at it than you do. Time now? Okay. okay. I, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, I thank really you so much. Questions. If you'd like to.